guys, my name is Beth and I'm the educator here at Trees for Tomorrow. And this morning I thought I would talk to you about pollinators. So we all um, know that pollinators help um, in the garden. What we might not know is that two thirds of crops depend on pollinators to produce. That's $55 million worth of crops annually in Wisconsin. So from your little home garden all the way up to the big producers, uh, it's a big deal. I got to experience that firsthand when I lived in Baltimore. I had a balcony garden and despite my great uh, plant sizes and their huge pots, I wasn't getting any cucumbers um, at all. And what I learned was that the bees couldn't find my third story apartment balcony garden. So I had to go out there and hand pollinate with a little Q-tip in order to get crop. And I did, I got some cucumbers, but it would have been a whole lot cooler and a whole lot uh, easier if some pollinators had come along. I did end up planting some flowers to draw their attention, but I didn't know then what I know now. So um, we'll talk a little bit today about pollinator gardens as well. It's not just our food that relies on pollinators. They're kind of the backbone for ecosystems. So think about trees that flower in order to produce uh, their fruit and nuts and things like that. And that stuff is what feeds wildlife. Think about all the wildflowers on the ground. Really any plant that needs to produce seeds in order to reproduce itself, it really needs a pollinator to do those type of things. So very important little guys. Um, and I thought maybe we'd uh, talk about some pollinator facts today. So we all know that bees are pollinators. In fact, they're probably the number one thing that comes to your mind when you think pollinator. Uh, but what we might not know is that there are hundreds of species of bees here in Wisconsin. And what's interesting is when I think of bees, I think of honeybees and their hives and their colonies with their queen and that whole social structure. Honeybees aren't even native to Wisconsin. Um, we brought them here for honey and for pollination, but um, the native bees are almost mostly solitary. Uh, so we have a lot of different species here, most of them overwinter in the ground, uh, and they are things like mason bees or leaf cutting bees or sweat bees, things that I don't even think of. We do have bumblebees here. In fact, in fact we have the rusty patch bumblebee, which was the first bumblebee to be uh, placed on the endangered species list. So that's a really neat thing to be looking for in your backyard. Another uh, very famous pollinator is a hummingbird. We all know and love them. We actually only have one species of hummingbird here in Wisconsin. We have the ruby-throated hummingbird. So I have a feeder just over there uh, trying to draw them into my backyard. Ruby-throated hummingbirds are primarily attracted to red tubular flowers. So a lot of people put out red liquid in their uh, hummingbird feeders. It's actually much better for the bird if you don't do that. It's better for the bird if you make the solution yourself instead of buying store-bought solution with that red dye in it, which can be pretty harmful. To make your own solution, you just need one cup of sugar and either three or four cups of water somewhere in there. Um, and you just stir it until the sugar dissolves. You can put a little bit of that in your hummingbird feeder, but try to change it out maybe every two days or so to keep it nice and fresh for them so there's no bacteria growing in there. It's a good idea when you change out the liquid from your hummingbird feeder to rinse the bird feeder under water and make sure that anything sticking in there rinses out and maybe about once a month, once every other month, wash it with a little diluted bleach water in order to really give it a good clean. You don't wanna be feeding these hummingbirds anything that can make them sick. Some really interesting things I didn't know about hummingbirds until we did our bird video a couple weeks ago is that hummingbirds don't just eat nectar from flowers. They also eat little bugs, which I think is pretty cool. They need their little protein sources too. When we think of pollinators, we might also think of beautiful butterflies zooming all over the yard. Um, it's interesting because butterflies do pollinate for sure, but they're actually less effective pollinators than bees are because the whole bee climbs up in that flower and gets itself covered down uh, with the pollen. Whereas with a butterfly, I don't know if you've ever watched them feed, it's pretty cool. They feed with what's called a proboscis. It's that really long mouth part that sticks into the flower and sucks up nectar. So because so much less of them is coming in contact with the inner part of the flower, they've got those long legs, they've got that long proboscis. They're not coming in contact with the parts of the flower that have a lot of that pollen on it like the bees are. 
Um, interesting also, there are endangered butterflies. So one, for example, is the Carner blue butterfly. We have it here in Wisconsin and it feeds on lupine. So we all know the link between monarchs and milkweed, but many of us don't know the link between Carner blue butterflies and lupine. So if you're looking to attract that endangered butterfly to your yard, maybe plant some native lupine. In addition to butterflies being pollinators, moths can be as well. Not all moths actually are pollinators. Some don't even have mouth parts, but that's a whole other story. Um, what's interesting is that when I think of moths, I think of flying around at night, but some moths are actually diurnal. So that means that they're active during the day. Although most are nocturnal, um, active at night. So I thought that was really interesting because that's when I learned that some flowers, in order to attract moths specifically as pollinators, open at night only and have a really strong scent at night. And that's how they draw in moths for pollinators. It's pretty cool. So those are kind of our most common pollinators that we know about, but many of us don't consider beetles. Beetles are pollinators too. Of the hundreds of thousands of plant species in the world, it's believed that beetles can pollinate about 90% of those plants. So that does not mean that they're the primary pollinator. They might not be the main pollination source for those plants, but they do aid in the pollination of those plants, which is a key feature. Based on fossil records, scientists actually believe that beetles were some of the first pollinators. So the first of the insects to climb into a plant um, and help to spread that pollen. And that's a pretty cool thing. Um, what's also really unique about them is we think about these cute little bumblebees uh, eating nectar and these beautiful butterflies uh, drinking the nectar as well. And beetles aren't really always like that. So a lot of beetles, when they're going to pollinate a flower, they actually eat their way into the flower. They eat into the center of the flower. Um, and while they're eating the parts of the flower, the petals and all those things, they're getting pollen on them and that's how they spread it. Another lesser known pollinator is actually flies. So especially this time of year when we're out and about trying to canoe, hike and enjoy the outdoors, not a lot of us like flies, but flies can be pretty important pollinators. So if you love chocolate, you can't say that you hate flies because the plant that chocolate comes from is actually solely pollinated by the midge fly. So without flies, we wouldn't have chocolate. And I personally don't want to live in a world without chocolate bees. There are actually several species of flies that look like bumblebees. So they've got that little bit of camouflage when they're moving around among the flowers. And you might think, how can I tell them apart? Well, if you get close enough, you can count the wings. Flies have one pair of wings where bees have two pairs of wings. And I've got a little surprise for you guys. Uh, mosquitoes are also pollinators. So that sounds crazy. When someone told me that, I absolutely didn't believe them until I looked it up, but it's true. So only female mosquitoes bite because they need that high protein blood source in order to produce their eggs. Male mosquitoes don't actually bite humans at all um, or anybody for that matter. So in fact, the main source of food for mosquitoes is still pollen. Of the 3,500 uh, species of mosquitoes, only about 200 of them actually feed on blood at all. It doesn't mean I like them anymore though. I've learned all of these facts about pollinators and I know that I want them here on my property. Um, we just moved into this house and I'm preparing to have gardens of flowers and produce and I'm really excited about it and I need those native pollinators to give me a hand to help me out in my food production. So I started looking up facts. Um, some things that I learned is that in order to give pollinators a good habitat in your yard, it can be a really good idea around the edges of the yard to leave big stick piles or leaf piles. So these guys need places to go, places to hide in bad weather, and leaving some brush piles can really be a good thing. Um, a lot of those bee species we talked about earlier, they actually nest inside like hollowed out stems of plants and things like that. So leaving some dead tall grasses, some uh, stick piles and things like that. Very good for pollinators. Um, I also know that it is bad to use herbicides and pesticides and things like that in your garden. So as, chem as chemical free as you can get your yard and your gardens, the happier the pollinators will be. So pesticides, we can obviously see that those would impact pollinators, but those herbicides, they can sometimes change the plant and then make it so that the nectar of the plant is not good for the pollinators. So we don't wanna do harm, so try to garden with less chemicals. 
Um, a new fact that I learned is that it's a good idea to include a water source in your yard. So these pollinators, they need a water source. So what I did was I put out a bird bath for the birds, but I also put some rocks in it as well because I want the pollinators to be able to get down in there and get a drink without getting stuck. Since my knowledge of uh, how to set up a pollinator environment in my backyard is pretty limited, um, I wanted to go to a local greenhouse. So going to a local greenhouse is a good idea because sometimes these big box stores, they uh, put chemicals in the plants before you purchase them. Um, that can be harmful to pollinators. So it's a really good idea to buy local and to buy native species. So what I did was over here in my yard, um, I actually cut out a little spot in our lawn and lined it with rocks underneath some trees and that's gonna be the site of my new pollinator garden. And I thought maybe we'd take a trip down to Hanson's greenhouse outside of Rhinelander and uh, we'd talk to some of the staff down there and see if they had any advice for us. Well, now that we got our garden bed all prepped and ready to go, I came on down here to Hanson's greenhouse by Rhinelander um, and I think we're gonna talk to some greenhouse experts and see what plants I should put in my garden. Let's go. Well, thanks so much for having us down here today, Beth. Um, I'm putting in a pollinator garden in my backyard and I was kind of wondering if you had any tips, tricks, advice, or uh, any stuff, favorite plants. Well, yeah. I mean, you want to stick with natives. A lot of the bees, butterflies, and insects um, for our area, yeah. their whole bodies and systems work well with the native plants. So um, we have an entire greenhouse filled with our native plants um, here. And we have them alphabetized and sorted by soil and moisture types. So there's uplands, things that like it drier, wetland things that'll like it wet and some even that can grow in standing water and then woodland we have a small selection and then an outside house as well so you're going to want to know is it sun or shade part sun once you'll know that you can narrow that down to certain plants do you have deer or rabbit um, problems that's going to kind of narrow down what you're looking at as well and then soil moisture or kind of soil that you have typically a lot of the soil around our area here is sandy so a lot of the plants do well in that sand. We have yep. butterfly weed, monarda, um, lupins, all different kinds of, of plants. And it also is a good um, representation and people can come and see what the plants look like in full size. You also want to think about uh, having things that will be blooming throughout the whole time. So early spring bloomers, midsummer, and then fall things. Some of the most popular pollinator plants that people come out here for is going to be butterfly weed or other kind of milk weeds. And I actually just read an interesting fact today that they, if you cut your common milk weed down halfway midsummer, that new growth on it is going to attract more female monarchs because they like that fresh growth and also they get more eggs on there and then it's also less likely to have um, any pests that are going to harm the monarch that are already growing on the plant because it'll be fresh growth. Most people who are worried about pollinators um, aren't going to cut their milkweed down but actually now would be a good time to do that for that regrowth. Um, wild bee balm, Monarda fistulosa, that's going to be another really popular one. Um, Prairie Moon Nursery um, is a really good resource um, for their website and information on native plants. They're located in Minnesota, just west of La Crosse. Um, whatever seed I can't collect off my own plants, um, I, I purchased from them. And we actually got to tour their facility last year. And we went at the end of the summer and they had the Liatris Ligulicious, the showy um, meadow blazing star blooming. And it was just covered in monarchs where we walked down the path and the monarchs were just flying everywhere so for that one that's the one that they get the most monarchs on they said we also really like Liatris aspera you also want to think about uh, shrubs um, we sell a lot of small shrubs in smaller pots example roses this is a pasture rose um, so you want to think about stuff like that as well we do recommend um, people plant more native so for every regular plant you put in you should try to think, I'm going to put a native plant in as well. So, because there are a lot of really nice ornamental perennials that the bees and butterflies like as well, but it doesn't benefit them to, to the most degree of every, you know, as the natives do. 
that's a good rule of thumb, especially if you're on the lakes or a river, is to all you know have some of those natives, and that's just going to benefit the ecosystem overall. Um, grasses are also really good, especially for birds. We have a lot of wetland grasses and sedges. And those are really good for a lot of birds in our area. On our website, hansonsgardenvillage.com, we have lots of lists. And of course, you could probably Google anywhere and find a lot of different things. But we have it more targeted to our area with the North Woods. If you're really looking at getting hummingbirds, we have lists for that. Bees, butterflies, birds, and then also covering trees and shrubs that would go in that area as well. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed our trip to uh, Hanson's and got some great ideas. I came home just now to start putting in the plants for the pollinator garden, and look who I found um, just chilling in the dirt. So I think, there he goes. I think that we got some uh, people that are kind of excited for me to get the plants in. So if you look behind me, you can kind of see on the ground here where I've laid out my plants. So once you pick your plants um, and you know what you want to put there, you should um, figure out what heights they're gonna grow to, how much they're gonna expand, and kind of plan out where you want things to be. You I only have seven plants that I picked up at Hanson's to plant in my garden. Um, all the ones I picked are really gonna fill out and uh, really kind of spread across the space. So I don't wanna pack my garden too tight the first year. I can add more later, but I really would hate to have to pull any. So I'm gonna get these guys in the ground uh, and then I'll show you what it looks like when I'm done. All right, well, I got all of my um, plants in the ground and look who I found right as I was watering them in. Yet another native bee already here and my plants aren't even blooming yet. So I'm gonna put him back. He can hang out there on my creeping Jacob's ladder. Um, we got buds going, so hopefully soon it'll be blooming for him. I hope you guys enjoyed this video on pollinators and um, I hope it motivates you to get out and maybe make a little oasis for them in your yard. Have a good day. Robin Ginner. I'm the Executive Director of Trees for Tomorrow and I'm here with Sheldon, one of our Animal Ambassadors. We're here at the Trees for Tomorrow campus in Eagle River and we hope you enjoyed today's program. Trees for Tomorrow is a natural resources specialty school and we were founded in 1944 as a reforestation effort by the pulp and paper industry. Today our focus is on educating the next generation about sustainability and our role as stewards of our natural resources. Funding for Trees for Tomorrow comes from a combination of program fees, corporate sponsorships, grants, and donations from individuals like you. If you found value in today's program, please consider making a donation to Trees for Tomorrow by going to our website and clicking on the Donate Now button in the top right corner. We also encourage you to follow us on social media and share your experiences exploring the outdoors. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you on our next episode. Thank you.